Japanese consoles go from epoch to super epoch. Epoch's cassette vision did reasonably well for itself when it debuted in July 1981. The console did, after all, have the Japanese market more or less to itself. That changed in July 1983, however, when Nintendo launched the family computer, Sega debuted the SG-1000, and the MSX platform standard made its first appearance. Suddenly, the cassette vision's decidedly humble approach to console design seemed downright archaic. Keenly aware of its system's sudden swerve into obsolescence, Epoch marshaled its talent and prepared for the launch of its ultimate gaming device, the Super Cassette Vision, which debuted in July 1984. Unlike the original Cassette Vision, the Super Cassette Vision contained all its hardware in the actual hardware. Its cartridges only housed a program ROM. In fact, it boasted the smallest carts on the market for a year. The diminutive size of its media was only trumped by Sega's MyCard format for the SG-1000 in 1985. Technologically speaking, the Super Cassette Vision sat somewhere between the Famicom and the SG-1000. It lacked some of the more impressive features of the former, such as its 52-color palette and smooth per-pixel scrolling. On the other hand, it boasted features that overmatched Sega's console. It offered 16 colors like SG-1000, but could output at a bizarre 309 by 246 pixel resolution versus Sega's more sensible 256 by 192 and it could display four times as many sprites at a time. The Super Cassette Vision does have the feel of a transitional system about it. It shipped with a pair of hardwired controllers that worked almost exactly like the original SG-1000 model's joysticks, with spongy side trigger buttons and a somewhat unreliable stick. The console's design hints at the sleek futurism of Sega's Mark III and looks less childlike than the Famicom. Even so, Epoch built a surprising deluxe feature into the system the ability to output pure RGB video. With the correct cable and the flick of a switch, the Super Cassette Vision has the ability to display the crispest, cleanest, purest video of any console of its era. An unconventional flex, but a welcome one for people doing video capture 40 years later. The Super Cassette Vision didn't fare too well on the market at the time, reportedly selling even fewer units than its middling predecessor, despite sporting three times as many software releases. Epoch even managed to line up some heavy hitters for its system, a handful of games by Namco, and multiple games based on licenses. It also received a single hardware revision, a model molded entirely in pink plastic called the Lady Cassette Vision. Hardly an essential pickup, but a fascinating one. Over the next 10 or so episodes, we'll be looking at the Super Cassette Vision's legacy, library, and hardware. Please look forward to it. The Super Cassette Vision's launch timing put it on the back foot right from the start. July 1984 also happened to mark the arrival of Famicom's first third-party software release from Hudson, a cataclysmic event that pushed that console into dominance. Around the same time, Sega shipped the SG-1000 II, a sleek new hardware case for the console that critically rectified one of the original model's greatest failings, its hardwired controllers. Meanwhile, here was the Super Cassette Vision, a console with graphics and audio capabilities that didn't quite stack up to those of Famicom, bogged down with built-in controllers that made the system less versatile than Sega's. But let's not begin by lamenting what Super Cassette Vision couldn't do. Rather, we should respect Epoch's more forward-thinking choices with this console. While clearly designed for small Japanese residential spaces with its shockingly short hardwired controller cables, its innards positioned it as a worthy competitor to the best of the era's international systems. Powered by a 4 MHz NEC chip and a discrete video processor, Super Cassette Vision had a fairly meager internal RAM supply, but compensated for that shortcoming with a powerful 14 MHz video chip capable of outputting higher resolution graphics than any other system on the market, including Famicom. Basically, a raw comparison of specs between Super Cassette Vision and every other system on the market at the time of its debut yields a combination of relative strengths and weaknesses that make it a worthy contender against its contemporaries. At the same time, you can also understand why it failed to outsell even the SG-1000. Like its meager 16-color output paired with the ability to display an impressive 128 sprites at any given time, 
the console's physical design feels, again, transitional. The lines of the hardware have a simple elegance to them that screams mid-80s, an effect amplified by the smoked plastic panel that houses the built-in controllers, which also have a transitional quality. The side buttons have the same mushy feel as the ColecoVision's joysticks. Thankfully, Epoch chose not to bother with the ColecoVision's integrated number pad, instead diverting that element to the console itself. Curiously enough, the lines and plastics and keypad add up to a system that most closely resembles the Othello Multivision. Not necessarily an auspicious sign. Of course, technical advantages are always fleeting. Eventually, something better is bound to come along. As with any console, the true test of the Super Cassette Vision is in its software library. And to its credit, Epoch's second programmable console fared much better on this front than the original Cassette Vision had. The company produced games at a speedier pace than they had managed for their original system, and by the time they retired the console and bowed out of the console race two years later, no less than 30 games had made their way to the system. While these included the usual fare you'd expect from a Japanese console of the era, mahjong and baseball and shooting games aplenty, Epoch built itself a fairly unique catalog of titles. The Super Cassette Vision contained clone games, but also unique creations, and even a number of licensed titles. Epoch even innovated in places, with a few cartridges containing the ability to offer battery backups. Not the lithium batteries that Nintendo would introduce on NES with The Legend of Zelda in 1987, but rather AA slots in oversized versions of the console's tiny colorful cartridges. It's a somewhat difficult system to collect for due to the scarcity of some of the late releases, but there's enough of interest to merit discovery. A version of Falcom's Dragon Slayer with battery-powered saves. The only Japanese console release of Pole Position 2? A random assortment of games imported from overseas? A loop on the third title? A precursor to cult Game Boy favorite Psyraid? It's all here on a console that barely made a blip in Japan and stirred up even less notice in its scarce European release. And that makes Super Cassette Vision very interesting. Like just about everyone watching this, I basically know nothing about Super Cassette Vision besides what I've just run down. So please join me on this journey of discovery as we explore the little console that didn't. Super Cassette Vision's story begins humbly and predictably with a pair of space shooters, Astro Wars 1 and 2, which was probably inevitable given Epoch's heritage. Epoch made its first big splash with a dedicated Space Invaders clone system called Battle Vader, and the Cassette Vision effectively amounted to a consoleized version of that standalone unit. So, sticking with what they knew, they kicked off their sequel system with a sequel to Battle Vader, and a sequel to that sequel. Astro Wars doesn't necessarily make for the most compelling first title for a console in 1984, even compared to the Famicom, which launched with ports of arcade games from 1981 and 82, or SG-1000, which debuted with a god-awful insult to the name Congo Bongo, Astro Wars feels devastatingly dated. By 1984, Japan's Space Invaders boom had long since subsided, and that love had found new forms of expression in the likes of Galaxian, Galaga, and, yes, Zevius. So this particular game, in which you control a missile base that has to destroy rows of invading aliens from space before they reach the ground, has the feel of an archaeological find. I mean, sure, both Famicom and SG-1000 would see ports of the actual Space Invaders in 1985, so in that sense props to Epoch for beating them both to the punch with a jazzed up version of the concept. However, in practice, this isn't the actual Space Invaders, and it lacks that game's cultural clout. And also, it's one thing for Space Invaders to show up as one of many titles on a system with a library dozens of games deep, but something else entirely for it to anchor a console. The fundamentals here should be familiar to anyone who has ever played a game older than Roblox. You control a small defensive weapon based on the ground, which can fire a single projectile at a time up into the sky. A series of flimsy shields stands between you and the invaders, which pour out of a mothership at the center of the screen's top. You need to destroy all invaders in a given wave in order to clear a stage, at which point the process of invasion begins anew. In short, you won't find anything shocking or new here. It's space invaders with beefier graphics. The invaders themselves appear as bipedal robot warriors, while your missile base appears to be a hovering space fighter rather than a tank. But per usual, the aliens can bombard you with projectiles while you can only fire a single shot into the sky at a time. They rely on the advantage of mindless numbers versus your quick but limited reflexes. Astro Wars does set itself apart from the original Space Invaders in a few ways. Beyond the visual elements, it operates differently as well. 
the invaders don't spawn as a full fleet filling the sky. Rather, they emerge from a mothership, a space fortress bristling with armaments, pouring out of the enemy base from both sides. The rows of robots march outward to the edge of the screen before doubling back and dropping a row, firing all the while. The more compact patterns and large number of aliens on screen make for a difficult take on the invader's concept, even on amateur difficulty. However, things work a little differently for the player as well. While you control a single defender craft, you have as many as eight lives to work with. I say as many as because your extra lives all appear along the bottom of the screen during the action. They show up as capsules along the ground, each of which contains a ship. You can choose which ship to activate when you begin a new stage, and any time your current ship explodes, you select a replacement from the capsules. The downside is that these capsules are every bit as vulnerable to alien fire as your active fighter. Once the aliens break through the defensive shield above you, they can take potshots that destroy your ship pods. You begin the game with seven ships in reserve, but aggressive invaders will whittle that down in short order. If you somehow manage to clear out an entire invader wave, the scene shifts to an interstitial conflict in which you chase and attempt to destroy the alien mother base. It's tough, but it's manageable, and success nets you a ton of bonus points. Regardless of your success in the bonus stage, the invasion process begins anew once the next level kicks off. Eventually, you'll lose, either by allowing all your ships to be destroyed or letting the invaders reach the same level as your base. As a game, it's all perfectly fine. It would probably be more fun if not for the Super Cassette Vision's controllers, which don't really support this kind of blistering action. The flabby fire buttons lack the sensitivity needed for precision fire, so you always feel like you're firing a few frames too late. Too late being the operative word here to describe Astro Wars as a whole, really. Happily, the sequel to Astro Wars, Astro Wars 2, Battle in Galaxy, feels quite a bit more of the moment than its predecessor playing more like Galaga than Space Invaders. Although the basic setup looks similar to the first Astro Wars, with the same alien mothership hovering at the top of the screen in opposition to your fighter ship, the similarities end there. You don't have to worry about shields or bases or extra life pods this time. It's just you and about 30 alien fighter craft facing off in outer space. The invaders this time around take multiple forms, all of which appear to have been blatantly lifted from popular sci-fi franchises. They're small, but they have varied appearances that match their varied behaviors. Every type of invader attacks a different way, with some swooping down in formation and others darting around singly in haphazard patterns. If Astro Wars felt like a high-speed interpretation of space invaders, Astro Wars 2 cranks up the Galaga concept to 11. Despite its somewhat sparse-looking visuals with tiny ships against the blackness of space, it offers a very impressive showcase of what the Super Cassette Vision hardware was capable of. I can't actually think of a game that moved at a comparable clip on Famicom by this point in that system's life. And while Sega put out a few brisk titles on SG-1000, this looks far more colorful and moves much more smoothly than anything that would ever appear on that console. Although Super Cassette Vision couldn't display more colors than SG-1000, it could generate more sprites at once and didn't have to limit those objects to a single color. This game throws a lot at you, in dizzying patterns. From the word go, Astro Wars 2 fills the screen with dozens of moving objects, all zipping around in overlapping patterns, dropping bombs and attempting to smash into your fighter. You get eight lives in this game, too, but they go quickly even if the invaders can't bomb them before they launch. Trying to weave between the speedy fighters and their deadly missiles while lining up shots takes real skill. And again, a better controller than Epoch designed. I have a feeling this is going to be a recurring theme throughout this series. After a few rounds, you'll eventually realize that for all its hectic pacing, Astro Wars 2 works best if you approach it slowly. Rather than slaloming around the bottom of the screen trying to match the movements of the enemies, it's best to lurk in the zone of relative safety toward the center of the screen and choose your shots carefully. Once you manage to clear out a wave of invaders, you'll enter a bonus round in which you pursue the fleeing mothership, just as in Astro Wars. Destroying the enemy fortress takes a lot more effort here, however. While scurrying away, it unleashes a stream of energy that darts around like the enemy ships do. Trying to fire around the beams without being hit takes some real doing, and seems nearly impossible in expert mode. But even if it's not the best designed bonus mode I've ever played, Astro Wars 2 overall works really well. It's a fun, unique interpretation of Galaga that uses an Epoch standard, Invaders clones, to show off the console's capabilities. A much stronger launch title than its companion release, and hopefully a sign of good things to come.
Next time on our Super Cassette Vision journey, we get the bog standard stuff out of the way. <laughs>